Eddie Chavez. Ruben Nava. And Jesse Romero. Jesus 911. Good morning. Soul Patrol briefing. 10 8. Jesus 911. Eddie, welcome. Hey, thank you, Jess. It's great to be here this Monday morning. I am reporting for duty, sir. And uh, we got some great topics today, man. We've got some uh, really, really good information that uh, Father Ripperger wants us to, to pass on to everybody. Great, great topics. Yeah, Eddie, this is what I call some pretty heavy intel. We always give good Catholic briefing and intel, but this one's deep. This one, yeah. Uh, yeah, this one, this one re- required an ops plan, an operation plan here. <laughs> That's right. And you know you know what, Jess? It's funny because there are some law enforcement comparisons here. We're going to get into it. But, um, but it, it's, it's, uh, it's very uh, chilling. It's very um, – it it, it'll catch everybody's attention. That's what's important about it, I think. Yes. Uh, in fact, this is such a chilling uh, article. I'm just going to make the sign of the cross. <laughs> and, and I cover on myself and ourselves – with the precious blood of Jesus and virgin most powerful, pray for us in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Okay. There's an article that Father Chad Ripperger, who's the, he's a professor of exorcism here in the U.S. Uh, the article's called The Sixth Generation. We're going to go through it, but I'm going to give what I believe is an overview of it, and then I want to hear Eddie's overview of it, and then we'll get right into the article. Here's the way I read it, Eddie. Father Ripperger... <clears throat> Uh, he uses the that word six generation, and the word six, you know, from from uh, all the biblical theology that I that I've taken, the word six is the number is it's it's known as in theology the broken covenant because the number seven is the number of God, the number of perfection, the number of God's covenant. Right. So six would be what would be called a broken covenant, or six would be called the number of imperfection. That's why you'll see. Uh, in the book of Revelation to describe the beast, they, in uh, Revelation chapter 13, I forget which verse, it's, they call him the 666. In other words, he's the broken covenant. Yes, and he's, also, he's imperfect. He's a, he's, a, he's a false, he's an imitator of the Messiah. Wasn't the the, uh, the uh, sixth day also uh, in general? In, um, uh, in the book of Genesis. In Genesis, yeah. Didn't he also uh, make the beasts on that? Oh, day? yeah. That's, I think another, that's another six there, right? Yeah. Yeah. And the, yeah. <laughs> on the sixth day of creation, God made, it says, the man and the beasts. Yeah, Okay. exactly. Okay, so the article's called The Sixth Generation, and what Father Ripperger did, he took the 20 and 21st century, and he started he started giving this kind of a countdown towards evil, and now it, it, it kind of explains, Eddie, the, the, the way evil has... I mean, it's been it's been coming down like like I look I look like a snowball coming down a mountain, yeah, and it's just gaining speed and it's getting bigger. Guys, yes, that's the way he describes mankind, starting from the World War One generation. Then he goes and he says, okay, they started giving up ground there. Then he goes into the World War Two generation. All right, so they started giving up more ground there, and I'm talking about you know becoming more permissive, more liberal. Uh, you know, not not tending to their to their morality, you know, just becoming lax in the morality, eliminating goes, eliminating the faith, just eliminating yeah. God from the from the dynamic. That's the important part. Yeah, that, as was from one. Then the next generation he talks about is ours, Eddie, the baby boomer. Yeah. And it, it it got progressively worse. I think it got real bad, and according to the article, in the baby boomer generation, that was us. Yeah, and then. He goes after to uh, the next generation X, generation X, generation Y, which has got incrementally worse because now they got the internet and social media and they know how to use it. So sin can be promoted a lot faster now and easier than the, from our generation. Yeah, our generation guys were buying snuff magazines, Eddie, yeah. and going to the lick, you know, lens liquor store and coming out with a brown bag. <laughs> now the X generation and the Y generation, because of uh, technology. Sin has ex- has exponentially gotten worse. Then he talks about the sixth generation, and he says, Eddie, that this is the the the, the worst generation that we're ever going to see. He says there's going to be open paganism in the streets, and we already see some of that right now. Remember the way we've been fighting these battles, where 
uh, Satanists are trying to put statues of Baphomet in public places, in parks, in city halls. And by the way, we reject you in Jesus' name. Go to the foot of the cross. Mother Mary crushes infernal head. So, Eddie, that's the way I read the article. How did you read the article? What did you get out of it? Yeah, just I I got some specifics as far as generational spirits, and like I said, we're going to get into that. But I also, now that you brought that up, it does it does have an eschatology, a, a end of times uh, dynamic about it, and that's what's very scary, just because everything that we talked about uh, with the number six has a connotation to some evil. So like you said, the the number of imperfections. So if seven is the number of perfection, seven sacraments, etc., the number six is, is something that, that we need to be aware of. Uh, and, and, and Father Ripperger is really calling our attention to this through this article. And uh, that's very alarming to me. <laughs> now, here's the last thing he said. We'll get right into the article. But here's what he said that did, it warmed my heart a little bit. He said about the sixth generation, the most wicked generation that we're ever going to see upon the face of the earth. And when I think about that, Eddie, I think about what God does to the wicked generations, Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, the, 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 the generation of Noah, uh, the generation that put Jesus on the cross, 1.2 million of them were killed and their temple was destroyed to the ground in Jerusalem. God deals with wicked generations with a great chastisement. And remember, in Catholic prophecy, many of the mystics have been warning us in approved apparitions about an appending chastisement, which means a punishment from God. So I'm making the connections here. Yeah. If Father Rick Ripper is demonstrating that the sixth generation called Generation Z, everybody under five years old, will be part of the most wicked generation that we've ever seen in our lifetime, comparable to Noah's generation, Jesus' generation, Sodom and Gomorrah's generation, then that means, that tells me, as I'm connecting dots, that there will be a great chastisement soon. Uh, and it also tells me, he says in the article, we'll, as, as, and we'll start it, he says that God is uh, amongst generation, the sixth generation, he's going to raise some great saints. It's a good time to be living in just because that's, that's the end result of it. And I just want to mention that Father Karapi, when he was active in his ministry, just... Uh, he often would say that he believed that, um, and you know, this is a, an individual who had the Virgin Mary uh, appear to him at several places. One of them was two blocks from my home. And and uh, uh, he said that he believed in his, during his lifetime he would experience uh, a great chastisement that God would bring upon the world. And so when you when you talk about that, I'm reflecting and, and remembering uh, what he said. And, and just we have to remember that this generation is going to be the one that knows nothing else but the keyboard, knows nothing else but how to do the internet, how social media. That's that's uh, dangerous. But let's get into it, Jeff. Let's get yeah. into the article. Okay, so I'll start off. I'll jump and jump with the Father Ripperger writes, um, exorcists refer to evil spirits that are passed from one person to another as generational spirits. The reason for labeling these spirits generational is that they are most often observed passing from parents to children. Generational spirits are normally passed when one person commits some kind of grave sin, introducing the demon into the household. I find that very interesting. By the way, he's told me that amongst the Latinos, we have one of the spirits that he's noticed. We have the spirit of, of alcoholism that we've, been, that we've received. He says this goes way far back into the Aztecs, this goes way far back into centuries of Mexican culture and South American culture. And he says that's one spirit that's continually being passed. Addiction. Addiction. Yeah. yeah. Then he writes, the passing of generational spirits is not just between parents and children, but may occur, may occur when people are in close contact with each other for long periods of time, when they live or work around another person. The process is not, is not mechanical in the sense that it is like an airborne virus that passes. Rather, the passing of generational spirits is a spiritual reality which occurs due to a variety of factors, including the state of the soul of one receiving the generational spirit. Someone in the state of grace is less likely to be affected. Someone in the state of mortal sin lacks protection. Well, to Eddie, we've been saying this for 10 years. Yeah. That that last phrase, we've been saying that for way over 10 years. So we're, we're, right, we're right on point. Right on point there, yeah. yeah. He writes, 
the relationship one has to the person, children under the authority of the parents are more susceptible. One's spiritual life, the more one meditates, prays, and receives the sacraments regularly, especially Holy Communion and Confession, the less likely one will be affected. And one's use of sacramentals, such as the St. Benedict Medal, Scapular, or Holy Water, which provide some protection. Eddie? Yeah, just one of the things I thought about during this uh, this first paragraph of Father's, uh, Father's article is that uh, my only comparison, because I worked in law enforcement so long, is, is a law enforcement... Um, connection that has to do with an old movie uh, uh, it's called Prince of the City. And that movie just, partners work together for so many years, they begin to learn about each other. They they, they work with each other every day. And I, and I remember, you know, uh, you, the, the individual saying, you know, there's a, you know, every leak in his home, every pipe leak in his home, you know, every, who his daughter's dating, you know, the in-laws, the outlaws, you know, everything about this person. And, uh, and the main character who states that uh, who actually turns state evidence and begins to work with somebody from internal internal affairs, and then later is controlled by federal federal government involvement. Says, "I sleep with my wife, but I live with my partners." Just this is how this is how law enforcement community acts, and I know there's other law, uh, other uh, communities that work together like that, and uh, I think that's something we have to be uh, very aware of. We'll be uh, right back, ladies and gentlemen. Stay with us on the sec- uh, second segment, Father Ripberger's article. We'll be right back. This is Terry Barber inviting you all the men to a men's conference June 15th at the Sacred Heart Chapel. This is going to be a day where we're going to talk about true masculinity. You know, there's a problem in the Catholic Church today. We have very few men who love the Catholic faith. And I know a lot of the wives that I'm listening to right now are saying, I want my husband to be on fire for the faith. Send him to the men's conference. Your son, send him to the men's conference by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877-526-2151. That's June 15th. When your husband comes back from this conference or your son, they're going to have a different view about their Catholic faith because they're going to meet three men who love Jesus and his bride, the church, and are going to instill in them a love for Christ and his church, the Eucharist, Our Lady. Bring them to virginmostpowerfulradio.org. Sign up there or call 877-526-2151. Full sheen ahead. It is only because of your continued prayers and generous donations that Virgin Most Powerful Radio can broadcast live each weekday. We count on your spiritual and financial support because you understand the urgent need for Catholic programming that shares the gospel with clarity and charity, but without compromise. Please prayerfully consider becoming a monthly donor. You can set it up with the touch of a button on our website, catholicrc.org. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. Soul Patrol, Jesus 911, two-man car. My partner, Eddie, we're talking about uh, this. It's an article called The Sixth Generation, which Father Ripperger proposed as it would be the most wicked generation we've ever seen upon the earth. Uh, Eddie and myself, we're part of the baby boomers. 
our kids and uh, and and the generation a little bit younger, they're part of Generation X and Y. Anybody under five, he calls uh, the sixth generation. And let's get right into the article, Eddie, and make some commentary. Yeah, Father uh, Father Ripperger goes on. He says some psychologists would simply attribute the behavior of the child as being learned from the parent. Well, that can be true. There are still certain behaviors which confession uh, which confessors, confessors yeah. uh, testify. Uh, children contract from the generational spirit since they would have no direct knowledge of the parents' sins. For an example, uh, hearing the confession of a 9 or 10-year-old, Father Ribberger says, uh, who had no exposure to pornography or anything indecent, yet suddenly begins suffering serious and unrelenting temptations against the Sixth Commandment. This is because the father of the house has been re- regularly viewing pornography or falls repeatedly into grave sin um, against the Sixth and Ninth commandments generational spirits can stay with one person in the family and be passed on through subsequent generations the fourth fifth or even further it says the generational spirit can sometimes skip people with uh, a within a generation and that is due to the fact that christ determines every iota of a person's spiritual battle and he can block the passing on of a generational spirit to a particular individual and, and we mentioned how the things that uh, uh, staying in a state of grace, using the sacramentals, etc., can help in that. Generational spirits can be blocked and removed from a family tree by members of the family reciting various prayers. Um, Here's my let yeah. me make a comment. Here's what I would say: um, by reciting various prayers, as Catholics, you have to have a prayer life. I mean, that's one of the ways you you maintain a relationship with God. And, uh, and you break any generational spirits. And the Bible, I'll give you just two spiritual direction, if you will, if you want to know what you should be doing as a Catholic. The Bible demonstrates that Daniel the prophet, he was a young prophet in Babylon. He used to pray three times a day. It says in Daniel chapter 6, verses 10 to 11, morning, midday, and evening. So, uh, I don't know about you, but he's one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament. That's probably a very good example for all of us. We should be praying three times a day, morning, midday, and evening, just like Daniel the prophet. Another point I'll make regarding what Eddie just read, the this, this section he just read, Father Ripperger, who's an exorcist, and he has an institute where he deals with people that are possessed and demonized, what he does is he tells possessed people, he puts them on a prayer, on, uh, he puts them on a... On, 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 prayer regiment. Yeah, prayer regiment, yeah. prayer regiment. And he has them, one of the things he has them do he has them pray the prayers, and you can get them off the internet. They're called auxiliumchristianorum.org. He has them pray that every day. Powerful prayers. But he also has them pray the Angelus at 6 a.m., 12 noon, and 6 p.m. And he tells Catholics that the reason he has people pray at that time of the day, because more Catholics around the world are praying at 6 a.m., 12 noon and 6 p.m. Those are like the official times of prayer in convents, in monasteries, in religious orders. So he'll get possessed people to pray the Angelus at that time. And he says, because you're uniting your prayer with millions of prayers around the world, and it's more powerful. I just thought I'd throw that in there, Eddie. That's Eddie, you got somebody calling. Yeah, I was going to say, it's a good segment to take the caller right now. Javier from San Diego. Javier, are you there? Yeah, Eddie. Uh, Jeffy. uh, Yes, sir. Yeah, that was you guys brought up the, the prayer at the end of the, the Fatima prayer. And then most of the time I, I do the Fatima prayer, I think, oh, yeah, it's, it's for that, that addicted person or that person, somebody really doing bad. And now I'm thinking, like, man, this might apply to me where it says, you know, um, lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of thy mercy. Yeah. And I'm thinking, well, I'm the shoe in, like, I'm the, I'm the guy, you know, but the most person you need him of your mercy is probably me at this moment. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you know that's a that's a good way to look at it, Javier. Because you know what, uh, we can always point fingers elsewhere, but there's always fingers pointed back at us when we point. So, so yeah, I mean, you know, uh, who's in more need of God's mercy than when I'm standing in front of an abortion clinic or I'm praying the prayers uh, that you just mentioned? Uh, I need it. I, I need it so that I can become a more holier person. Uh, and and that's that's the trick, man. The the trick is to remain as holy and in a state of grace as we can be. And uh, yeah, that's a good point about that prayer, Jess. Yeah, here's, Javier. Here's the only thing that I would say. Um, you know, I've talked to good theologians about this, and you know, God knows 
God knows what Javier needs. He knows what Jess and Eddie need. He knows what we need and when we need it and how we need it. So I, I figure, I figure when I pray, if I pray for other people, and I've been told this by some very, very deep spiritual directors, if I pray for other people, God, it, 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 that's going to be pleasing to God. It's going to be meritorious, and God's going to smile upon me because I'm, I'm praying for other people. I'm being altruistic, and God will take care of my needs. So there's also a second way to look at it. You know, if you're praying for your kids, your wife, your family, your unconverted family members, friends that are drunks or whatever, because you're doing that, and that's an act of love, an act of charity, praying for others, God is going to take care of what you need. So th that's another way of looking at it. You'll gain some benefit from it. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The, the end of that, also at the uh, Noon Angelus, you know how you guys are talking about the Noon Angelus, it's yeah. that uh, pour forth, we beseech thee, O Lord, thy grace into our hearts. I mean, that's a beautiful prayer, too, just in itself right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see why Rip Ricker is referring to that prayer at, you know, the Noon Angelus. Yeah, exactly. Pour Makes your sense. grace into our hearts. I mean, look, look at the, the theology in that prayer. And also, I'll tell you why he also, because I've talked to him about this. He says the reason he, he, uh, he refers this prayer is because he says this is one of the, pray one of the two prayers that the devil and demons hate the most. Why? Because that prayer, the Angelus specifically, gives us the theology of why the devil rebelled against God. So every time you say the Angelus or a Hail Mary, you're repeating out loud to the devil and demons, <laughs> what cast them out of heaven, the, 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 their failure to accept the incarnation. And so when we pray a Hail Mary and we pray the Angelus, we accept the incarnation. We accept by faith that God became a man. And we accept that God became a man and continues to give us grace. And so those prayers, when we say them out loud, it's like scratching a chalkboard, you know, in, in front of a bunch of kindergarten kids. Demons can't stand the Angelus of the Hail Mary. Amen. Thanks, guys. Keep up the good work. All right, brother. Better, brother. Take care. Yep. God bless. Yes, sir. All right, Jess. 40 for duty, sir. That's it. Okay, so we left off, Jess. Uh, I think it was, uh, the generational spirit can sometimes. No, we we did that. Yeah. Uh, okay. However, however, there uh, that is a topic for another article. So the topic of this article is the generational spirits of the past five generations. Father says, uh, demons invert the order established by God, as we already know that, and they often do so by mimicking the things of God. Right. So we always say that that the uh, uh, Satan is, is is an ape. Yeah, he apes God. God. God, uh, God assigns each person a guardian angel, which is common knowledge among many Catholics. Many believers, however, do not know that the pious tradition also tells us that God assigns guardian angels to families, corporations, certain buildings, churches, parishes, states, countries, and regions. Demons do the inverse. Yeah, so stop there. Yeah. So, so what that means, yeah. everything Father Ripperger says about guarding angels, <laughs> Satan does the same thing. Applies it, yeah. He assigns a demon to everything you just mentioned right there, to every person, every family, every corporation, building, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Eddie. That's, uh, yeah, I, I, absolutely. I just thought I have to throw that in there. Yeah, we can't forget that. By the permissive will of God, certain demons afflict families, corporations, parishes, countries, and regions. But... Uh, one area often overlooked in the discussion is, in this discussion is how demons invert the order established by God in relation to a particular generation. Let me make a comment. Go ahead. Go ahead. This is important. Father Ripper says this over and over in his lectures and in this article. Notice the and you just read it right there. He says because people get start becoming very afraid as they hear this and they said what the demons assigned to my family what the demons assigned to my parish what. Notice what Father put there by God's permissive will. Right. That's very important. Demons can't do anything without being permitted by God to do such things. And if you want to see a biblical example of that, all you have to do is read Job chapter 1. Okay? So don't think that demons can act willy-nilly and do whatever they feel like. They, got, they need permission, and they have parameters. Even St. Padre Pio says, even with the permission... Uh, he quotes St. Augustine. He says that demons are like a dog, a wild dog on a chain. And God holds that chain. And so, yeah, God allows him to walk, let's just say 12 feet, you know, 10 to 12 feet in a, in, in a radius. 
So long as you as a Catholic don't walk within that territory where God allows the devil to roam because God is holding him by a chain. Long as you stay away from those boundaries, you're fine. Right. And what does it mean to stay away from those boundaries? Live in a state of grace. So what does it mean to enter into those areas where the, this wild dog is walking that dog ha- God has in a chain? That's when you jump into mortal sin. And, and the just, three main mortal sins, Eddie, that Father Vince Lampert, another exorcist from Philly, says the three main mortal sins that get people in trouble with the devil is Americans are A, pornography, B, uh, drug addiction, and C, the occult. He says those are the three most prevalent mortal sins where most Americans, they step into that territory where the devil's allowed to roam by God. And just it just makes sense that God would allow this so that we could show him our love. Because without, right. without God's permissive will, there'd be, no, you know, this be a, a whimsical universe because then, you know, everybody's going to love God. And, but th- this way we are forced to show God that we love him by maintaining the order of his creation. Without it, that's when we get into trouble. And that's why he gives this, this permissive will. Yeah. And, and Eddie, and, and, and because planet Earth is a time of testing. Yeah. That's why, remember, even in the Hail Holy Queen, what do we call planet Earth? A valley, valley of, tears. of tears. Yeah. What does King David call planet Earth in Psalm 23? The valley of the shadow of death. What does Job chapter 7, verse 1, call planet Earth? He says, life on Earth is warfare. And so when you read scripture and Catholic prayers, God is telling us, guys, you're not home yet. You're fighting. That's why the church on earth is not called the church of nice. It should not be called the church of nice. It's called the church militant. Militant. That's what we are. Because we're fighting. As St. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, that Bible verse right over my head, we're fighting invisible spiritual forces in the air that we cannot see those are called demons eddie yeah jess and you know we have, when we talk about the angelic court we talk about the nine angels that god has provided for us but we got to understand that the devil apes god and so there are nine generations of angels that potentially can do us harm and are assigned to us our homes etc Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be right back. We're talking about Father Ripperger's article of Sixth Generation. So stay with us. Don't go away. We'll be... This is Terry Barber inviting you, all the men, to a men's conference June 15th at the Sacred Heart Chapel. This is going to be a day where we're going to talk about true masculinity. You know, there's a problem in the Catholic Church today. We have very few men who love the Catholic faith. And I know a lot of the wives that I'm listening to right now are saying, I want my husband to be on fire for the faith. Send him to the men's conference. Your son, send him to the men's conference by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877-526-2151. That's June 15th. When your husband comes back from this conference or your son, they're going to have a different view about their Catholic faith because they're going to meet three men who love Jesus and his bride, the church, and are going to instill in them a love for Christ and his church, the Eucharist, Our Lady. Bring them to virginmostpowerfulradio.org. Sign up there or call 877-526-2151. Full sheen ahead. It is only because of your continued prayers and generous donations that Virgin Most Powerful Radio can broadcast live each weekday. We count on your spiritual and financial support because you understand the urgent need for Catholic programming that shares the gospel with clarity and charity, but without compromise. Please prayerfully consider becoming a monthly donor. You can set it up with the touch of a button on our website, catholicrc.org.
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. Two-man car, Jess and Eddie, Soul Patrol. Hey, uh, we're giving you some serious Catholic intel and briefing. Uh, put all this information into your war bag when you hit the streets. Get out there and evangelize. Get out there and save souls. Get out there and warn people to live in a state of grace. Just one of the things that I wanted to mention about the things that we were talking about up to this point was that um, we talk about generational spirits. We talk about somebody introducing a demon into our home, which is part of a generational spirit. And like Father said, it's not like an airborne virus. You could catch it because somebody is. No, you have to be prone to it. You have to... Uh, uh, be uh, in, in mortal sin. So just because, for example, just mentioned that Latinos have this this issue with alcoholism, it seems to be a, a, a trendy in, in the Latino community way back from generations on. That that is one thing. However, when the when the uh, a sin is brought into the family, people that could possibly fall from attachment don't have to be attached to the original sin, to the sin of of alcoholism, let's say. So it can be also a a different sin. So let's say somebody who has an alcoholic father or or relative, uh, they, if they're in a state of mortal sin, can be attached to pornography or they can be attached to, um, uh, you know, some other mortal sin that that, that, that chases them, that... that, uh, attracts them so that's that's another thing just to notice here um uh because i think it's important for us to delineate and and make the distinctions about what we're talking about jess yeah we continue talking about the sixth generation and and for those that are just tuning in right now let me give a 30 second overview it's an article that father chad ripperger wrote professor of exorcism where he says that he he, he counts down Six generations starting in the 20th century. World War I generation, second generation, World War II generation, third generation, my generation, Eddie's, baby boomers, next generation, generation X, next generation, and generation Y, and then he calls the sixth generation those under five years old right now. Here's what he's positing in this article. He's saying that each generation has got in, uh, incrementally more immoral more sinful so he tracks it from the world war one generation and what he's positing in this article is that the sixth generation is because of social media really and because of just liberalism and modernism has been embedded in schools now i mean plant parenthood teaches uh, sex education in schools the stuff that's being blasted on television and in the internet open pornography uh open you know pr- gay pride parades in cities you know lax has the the the, the homosexual pride colors right now in the airport uh, i mean it's just open now eddie it's open and so father ripperger says that the sixth generation is going to be the worst generation we've ever seen and this reminds me as as a bible junkie of the generation of noah the generation of sodom and gomorrah and the generation of jesus When God comes across wicked generations, God wipes them out. But then the good part of the article is, remember, God always says, if I find 50 righteous people, I'll spare you. I'll spare the city. Father Ripperger says, in the sixth generation, because it's going to be so wicked, he's going to raise up some some incredible sixth-generation saints. So you're going to have some Maria Goretti's. You're going to have some St. John Bosco's. You know, you're going to have some... So, some uh, uh, some Daniel, Daniel the prophets, these teenage saints that God's going to raise up in the future amidst this wicked generation. So that's 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 a hope. Good news. That's that's, that's a good that's news. A, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, Jessica, because we have. We, we've given up so much ground here. Like you said, the schools, uh, just, just society in general. And I remember, I remember Crappie saying very often, we've given up the high ground. Well, what does high ground mean? The high ground is a military term talking about when you have the hill, you have an overview and, and a certain control over the land that's being battled up over. So when he says we give up the high ground, you know, I, I remember in East L.A. we used to have the, uh, you guys remember, you and Ruben remember, uh, just uh, the Alps, uh, the, the, the mountainous area that are around the 10 freeway and, and uh, uh, near the Long Beach freeway. And that's that's something where we used to go up there and, and we were always going in there with two or three cars in, in the nighttime because... Uh, people had the high ground on you. They took all the signs away, and you couldn't tell what street you were on. So, and they actually shot at police cars absolutely. on several locations from 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 the from the from the Alps. Yeah, I got I got a, a snipe there from uh, <laughs> on the free on a freeway stop one day. Anyway, yeah, okay. I know several partners yeah. of mine from East LA that got you know sniped also. Yeah. And any and also you know speaking about the high ground, all you got to take a look at is what happened a few days ago in Normandy invasion that we just we celebrated. Oh yeah, the 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 anniversary. That's a good example. That's that's why so many of our young brave Americans were killed is because the Germans had, as you high said, ground. the high ground. Yeah. All you got to do is watch uh, what what's the movie? Uh, 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 yeah, I know what you want to tell. <laughs> Saving Private Ryan. Bro, yes, the brothers, yeah. all the brothers. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So. Okay, go ahead, Jessica. I've lost yep. track of where we're at here. Where are we? Yeah, here? I know where we're at here. I know where you left off. Okay. okay. Um, each generation has a vocation okay. of a sort. The word vocation is not used in the proper or strict sense of the word, referring to a calling to the priesthood or religious life, but in the loose sense, indicating that each generation is called by God to accomplish certain tasks, fight off certain evils, achieve certain perfections. See, this is two words that Father's always saying that we as Catholic Christians are called to. He's always saying this in his lectures. He says, we're called to fight off evil. In our generation, we're always called to fight off evil. We're going to be held accountable to the extent that we don't do that when we die in Judgment Day. And he's always using this term, Eddie. He always says, achieve certain perfections. Mm. That's a huge mm. uh, phrase that he uses in all his lectures. He's always saying, Catholics, achieve the perfections, achieve the per perfections. And what he's talking about there are the virtues, yeah. faith, hope, love, justice, prudence, temperance, fortitude. He, this is a constant theme of this exorcist, and he tells people that are possessed and demonized, in order to get healed, you've got to reach perfection. And what he means by that is the seven virtues. So he says... Um, God assigns an angel to protect that generation, and sometimes the angel is the one who is given to help the generation overcome the problem it faces. But demons, by the permissive will of God, also afflict the generation. It is not taken doctrine in moral or spiritual theology to recognize that the church and the world are in a particularly bad state, morally and spiritually. So how do we get there, Eddie? Yeah, it says a great deal of solid scholarly work has shown how the connection of ideas and the flow of history got us to this point. But rarely does any of this scholarship touch on the preternatural side of the equation. Remember, preternatural, the angelic the realm, it's below the supernatural, and then the natural is us, we on earth. It says uh, the answer to how we got here is complex, involving many different agents, causes, and effects so to simplify an explanation of the bad state of affairs as merely a preternatural problem would be far too facile and narrow in scope. The spirit forces driving history are real, and they are real because they affect real people who in a limited way direct the flow of history. I absolutely. Just that was a powerful sentence right there. Yes. I I'm going to make that in blue-collar language. What Father Ripperger just said in that one sentence, he said... What I, what I have in my, in my book, uh, demons are primary evil, and demons who are primary evil use human beings who are secondary evil as their useful idiots. That's exactly what he said right now, obviously in more doctoral language. Yeah, absolutely. It says, obviously, God is the Lord of history, and the flow of history is ultimately up to him. But God does use secondary causes, like just just said, human beings, to determine history to some degree and so we we thank god for those people that he puts into 
uh, uh, our lives as, as, as public servants that, that do a good for society. Uh, and, and, and we, we have to fight against those people that we know he's put on earth, Planned Parenthood, etc., that want to drag us down uh, to the pit of hell. Go ahead, Jess. You can take, uh, take yeah. this one. Okay. Uh, Father Ripperger writes, uh, <clears throat> he goes, demons, or more specifically, generational spirits, and then he says, not everyone in a particular generation will be affected by the particular generational spirit of that generation. He says, how he says how each of the last five generations has had a generational spirit easily identifiable, which has afflicted it. Then he says, lastly, I'm going to talk about the sixth generation now being born, whose direction, if the sixth generational spirit gets its way, does not bode well. So then he goes to the, he, here's the, the where the problem started. Yeah. Where I, I would say devil said, send his, his SWAT team after the World War I generation, and here's where the problem started. He said this, the lost generation. To begin, we go back to the generation which came of age during and shortly after World War I. This generation became known as the lost generation, a term popularized by Ernest Hemingway in his novel, The Sun Also Rises. This generation is also known as the World War I generation, and it saw everything from the advent of the automobile and daily life, some of them even have, may even have plowed a field with a horse, to see man step upon the moon. It is the complex generation because some of this generation did not adopt the values of their parents, but instead indulged in hedonism. However, most members of this generation followed the traditions of their parents, especially in the area of religion. One hallmark of this generation was their appro appropriation of suffering. He says, in my experience, and in the experience of many others from what we read, this is the generation that could suffer without complaining. They went through the First World War, although most did not fight in it. They went through the Great Depression. They also went through the Second World War, and most did not fight in that war either. But the ability to endure suffering and to offer it up was almost at the level of instinct. In fact, for them, suffering was such a part of life that to talk about, about it was like talking about the rate of growth of the grass outside. Life was suffering, a veil of tears. And no one's and and no and so one simply did not talk about it. But he goes, therein lies the beginning of the problem, in my estimation. Uh, we'll stop right there. Yeah. Because this is so meaty right here, because here's where the problem starts, and uh, we'll pick it up on the next segment. We need to break that down a little bit. We'll be right back, we'll be right back. don't leave. This is Terry Barber inviting you, all the men, to a men's conference June 15th at the Sacred Heart Chapel. This is going to be a day where we're going to talk about true masculinity. You know, there's a problem in the Catholic Church today. We have very few men who love the Catholic faith. And I know a lot of the wives that I'm listening to right now are saying, I want my husband to be on fire for the faith. Send him to the men's conference. Your son, send him to the men's conference by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877-526-2151. That's June 15th. When your husband comes back from this conference or your son, they're going to have a different view about their Catholic faith because they're going to meet three men who love Jesus and his bride, the church, and are going to instill in them a love for Christ and his church, the Eucharist, Our Lady. Bring them to virginmostpowerfulradio.org. Sign up there or call 877-526-2151. Full sheen ahead. It is only because of your continued prayers and generous donations that Virgin Most Powerful Radio can broadcast live each weekday. We count on your spiritual and financial support because you understand the urgent need for Catholic programming that shares the gospel with clarity and charity, but without compromise. Please prayerfully consider becoming a monthly donor. You can set it up with the touch of a button on our website, catholicrc.org.
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show, and they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. Soul Patrol, Jesus 911, two-man car. Team Jesus. Eddie, we're getting right into the, the thick of it. We're getting right into the actual problem where Father Ripperger's talking about the way we started going south a hun- over 100 years ago. Starting with the World War I generation, here's what he says. Okay? He says, he calls them the first generation, but he also calls them the lost generation. He says here, uh, they did embrace suffering, but he says, but therein lies the beginning of the problem, He's talking about the World War I generation. He goes, in my estimation, that would lead to a complete societal breakdown. The generational spirit of the lost generation, known as the World War I generation, was the spirit, and here's the demon that he's attaching to that, he says, is the spirit of incommunication. This generation simply did not talk to their children or communicate to them the ability to embrace their cross, appropriate one's sufferings for, for virtue's sake in the way they actually did it. And we'll, we'll take this caller right now. But let's say he says, this is not a conscious fault on their part from what can be gathered, but it is the common experience of their children, many of whom are alive today and testify to the truth of this, of this observation. This was the generation of austerity and simplicity, talking about the World War I generation. They owned only what they needed, no more and no less. And part of this was the effect of suffering through the Depression, and part of it from simply not having a lot of money throughout life. However, the simplicity and austerity was a sign that even after the suffering had ended, they did not indulge themselves. That would come in a later generation to indulge, to indulge oneself. One first has to avoid suffering. So th- he says the first demon that he says that he sees generationally that came after us as Americans was in the World War I generation, though they knew what suffering was all about and they embraced suffering, he said they had a, they had a spirit of incommunication. He said where they did not teach their offspring redemptive suffering, offer it up. Uh, right. He says they allowed their they allowed the next generation to embrace hedonism. And so Let's you know, go to a, a real quick call real quick. and then Yeah, real quick, just before we go to the caller. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Robert, hold on. I just wanted to mention that, that yeah. this incommunication spirit, I mean, there, there's a human reason. I mean, these people uh, experience a world war that, that it, it was not popular. It was not, uh, you know, it was something they had a, deal with and and the best way they could deal with it on a human level was to internalize stuff yes. so we have to be careful that even though yes. we're following human natural tendencies there can be evil spirits attached to them and that's what uh, father ripper was talking in, about here in other words eddie they, they were in such shock of yes. what they saw a hundred million people around the world being killed by communism right uh, the great depression they saw such evil this generation that they were almost, you know, when 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 you you go into a crime victim, you roll up on a nine one one call, and the person saw something so evil, they're in a state of shock. They can't say anything. They can't exactly. give no statements. They can't talk. That's right. They're looking at you, and they're like in a trance. Solve this generation, solve Eddie. They saw such evil. They went in a trance, and they were not able to communicate that pain and suffering to the next generation. Exactly, and that's a human tendency, but it's also evil in the regard that Father Ripperger's. Uh, 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 talking about it because they, they weren't able to uh, to share that. Okay, Robert, South Del Monte, man, one of my favorite calls. What's up, brother? Hey, good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good so morning, brother. Uh, out of charity, there's a guy who's a full-blown alcoholic, drug user, but, uh, you know, they came to our home and they, and they needed to take a shower, have a meal and all that stuff. Uh, so um, we let him into the house and, and took care of him, right, and then he left. And it's an afterthought, you know, this is a phrase I'm sure most people have heard of you. You get lay with dogs, you get fleas. Mm. 
So I thought, you know, we better bless the house in case there's some kind of contamination. And and I don't know if that's superstitious or not, so I just offered it up to the Lord. Got my prayer book from the St. Michael Shield uh, Men's Prayer Group. Got my little daughter with a spray bottle, filled it up with holy water, and and we sprayed the four corners of the house, you know. (laughs) And um, uh, we just wanted to be sure. Sure. Uh, so, number one, I'd like to get your thoughts thoughts about that, and then I got something else after. I think you did the right thing. Yeah. I mean, you brought a stranger into the house, probably living in mortal sin. Yep. I mean, he's if he's out there homeless and on the street, and uh, yeah, I mean, and people have spirits attached to them. Like you so said, you did, Robert, you did the right thing. You just kind of uh, vaccinated your house with sacramentals and prayer, and you're the man of the house, so you have the authority to drive out demons. So, Robert, you're right on point. And you know what? You know, Robert. Also, I would say, and if, if there was nothing there. Uh, because I'm sure you wouldn't just bring anybody into the home. I'm sure there was some level of, of uh, review that you, you went over before you brought them over. There may have been nothing wrong with them, and that's okay. You still blessed the house. You, the blessing was with uh, with your family. So uh, either way you cut it, you did the right thing. Yep. Go ahead. It's a win-win situation, which you did, whether he was demonized or not. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's great to hear. And, gentlemen, I'd just like to extend a, a gem, uh, an invitation to – all the men who are listening, uh, normally we meet 6.30 Saturday at the historic chapel, but we got the, uh, Jer- Terry's got that spiritual warfare conference. We're going to be meeting there at 6 o'clock. And I'd like to invite all the men that can come to come and, and uh, pray with the men's uh, prayer group, and they get to witness and use the, the prayer group I used to bless the house. And uh, if they like, they can get a copy when they're there. So I'd like to extend that invitation. Perfect. Thanks, Robert. Thank you, Robert. I know you guys will be there early. We'll see you on be, Saturday, partner. Yep, you'll be uh, getting the demons out of there and everywhere around the area so uh, so they can have a great conference. We can have a great conference this weekend. Yeah. Good deal. Thank you, man. God bless. All right, take care. Eddie, pick it up. So now Father Ripperger talks about the next generation. This is generation number two. Yeah, this is the, it's called the greatest generation. Tom Brokaw, uh, a very influential news guy, uh, coined the term the greatest generation to describe the generation which grew up in the United States during the Great Depression and fought in World War II, as well as those who, uh, who whose productivity within the war's home front made a de- decisive material contribution to the war effort. Brokaw opined that it was the greatest generation any society has ever produced and that those of this generation fought not for fame or uh, and recognition, but because it was the right thing to do. This generation is sometimes referred to as the GI generation. Uh, we have very few members of that generation left, by the way, okay? Uh, we just, like Jess mentioned earlier, we uh, celebrated the 75th anniversary of D-Day. There was only about 100 or so of the participant attendees in Normandy when that occurred. All were 91, uh, I think 91 or 92 years old, Jess, and, and older, uh, who won't be at the next one. Uh, but these are uh, men and women that joined the service because the country needed them. Okay. However, it is hard to share Mr. Brokaw's enthusiasm for this generation. While it is true that men and women of this generation are some of the most decent people uh, one will encounter, there was a flaw in this generation that be- began a cascade of events that would land us in the worst state in recent history. The generation grew up during the Great Depression, but they did not appropriate their suffering while going through it. They did not embrace their cross in the manner that their parents did. They fought the Second World War, but they came back determined that this would never happen again. Underlying their great deeds was a spirit that was unwilling to suffer. They could deny themselves even with ease when necessary, but they did not like it. That's important. That's an important distinction there. Yeah. Paul that, Ripper, yeah, he continues yeah. with this. It's called the greatest generation or the second generation in, in the theology of, of generational spirits. He says, their generational spirit, is the demon, in other words, that attached to them, he says, was the lack of mortification, an inappropriation of suffering. How could this accusation be levied against such a generation that did so much for this country? fought the Second World War, and were hallmarked as hard workers. They did it because their goal was not to attain spiritual perfection by the perfection of virtue. Rather, it was to obtain something materially better, primarily for their children. 
They indulge their children. That's, that's, that's the big criticism he has of the center. He says, yeah. they indulge their children, as we shall discuss in the next generation, to the degree that they could within, con, within, confi, within the confines of decency, but indulge them nonetheless. They indulge them by giving them things which prior generations would have warned against. And they indulge them by removing any obstacle to their indulgence. How do we know this? Let us not forget, this is the generation which blocked passing on the tradition of the Catholic Church. Yeah. Eddie, Eddie, this was the McCarrick generation, Bernardine, <laughs> That's right. Mahoney's. This yeah. is what he's talking about. Yeah. Why? Because following tradition requires self-discipline, self-control, and above all, self-denial. If one is to pass on tradition intact, we can only do so by putting, he can only do so by putting himself aside making sure he does not interject himself into it and pass pass it on without tainting it. The greatest generation did nothing of the sort. It was this generation that wrought Vatican II and its aftermath. It was this generation that brought a loosening of disciplinary requirements in the church. It was this generation that allowed dissent, unorthodoxy, and immorality to have a life in the church. It was this generation that began the sweeping under the carpet of the pedophile problem, the homosexual problem among the clergy, that rejected and did not enforce or teach the immorality of contraception. In effect, this generation was handed a church that by some accounts could be considered at its prime, morally, spiritually, and fi- and financially, uh, and they passed on to us, that, uh, uh, and financially bankrupt. In order to maintain discipline, to maintain orthodoxy, to maintain the good of the church, self-denial and embracing the cross was necessary. Instead, the indulgence of embracing the modern world was given pride of place. It is arguable that the greatest generation is one of the worst generations in the history of the Catholic Church. Why? They gave us modernism. One of the worst heresies, if not the worst heresy in the history of the church. It was permitted under this generation, promoted and embraced under the eye of this generation. And next, on Wednesday, Eddie, we'll pick it up about their children, the baby boomers, which is our generation. Yeah, that's a little harsh on the greatest, oh, what yeah, we, what yeah, we yeah, think is the greatest. About but, them, Eddie. but you yeah, know what? It's, it's true. We're going to break it down, Jess, on Wednesday a little bit more. Uh, I can't argue with that analysis. No, you can't. No. This is the McCarrick generation. Right. This is exactly what's brought the church to this point in history. And that's what we're talking about. Not no, the greatest I mean, generation. Some props, Eddie. They, many yeah. of them fought exactly. you know, to, against Nazism and to promote you know, democracy and liberty, yeah. but it was also this generation, Eddie, that sold the farm. So that's uh, that's difficult to take, but it's real. It's reality, and it's true, and he's got the, the uh, information got the right there. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for being with us this uh, Monday. Uh, it's good to be with you. Uh, stay tuned for uh, tomorrow. Uh, Ruben will be with Jess tomorrow, and uh, stay tuned also for Gary Machuda on Hands-On Apologetics. Thanks for being with us once again, and remember, St. Michael the Archangel, pray for us now and forever. Talk to you later. God bless. Thank you. St. Faustina's Prayer for Priests O my Jesus, I beg thee on behalf of the whole Church, grant it love and the light of thy Spirit, and give power to the words of priests, so that hardened hearts might be brought to repentance and return to thee, O Lord. Lord, give us holy priests. Thou thyself maintain them in holiness. O divine and great High Priest, may the power of thy mercy accompany them everywhere and protect them from the devil's traps and snares, which are continually being set for the souls of priests. May the power of thy mercy, O Lord, shatter and bring to naught all that might tarnish the sanctity of priests. For thou canst do all things. Amen. Virgin Most Powerful, pray for us.